Hello, everyone. We're just getting everybody in. Hello, I see some familiar folks from COC. So thank you very, very much for being here today. Um, again, thank you. Well, hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you for being uh, here. Uh, this is um, our civic dialogue series for um, uh, April 7th. And I know today is Good Friday. And I know for some of us, uh, this has been uh, uh, the, the holiday break for um, spring break, at least for certain campuses. So again, I just want to say thank you very much for being here. Um, before we get started, I'd like everyone to go ahead and put your names and your college in the chat, please. And this uh, allows us to not only uh, see who's here, but also to make sure that those of you who are receiving flex credit uh, will do so uh, after the event. So um, what I'd like to do is again, just uh, thank all of you for being here. I am Patty Robinson, Faculty Director of Civic and Community Engagement at College of the Canyons. And I'm joined by my colleague, Kimberly Rosenfeld, who is Chair of the Education Department and Chair of Women and Gender Studies at Cerritos College, and also um, is a 3CSN uh, facilitator. And we're also joined today, um, or I actually, um, she was on earlier, but uh, we're, we're running it now, but we have two special folks that have been helping us throughout the semester, uh, Keelan Koenig and Rebecca Moonstone, also from FreeCSN, who have been just fantastic tech support folks for us. Um, just to give you a little bit of the history of FreeCSN, we began our dialogue series in fall of 2020 as part of a Bringing Theory to Practice um, grant. Um, this particular grant came out of uh, work that we were doing with the community college system and the CSU system. Um, it started obviously as a way to try and create um, a better way of getting folks to understand civic learning and democratic engagement. And at the same time to inform, inspire and engage others um, to, to introduce to you as well as students and administrators and staff, um, these kinds of, or the kinds of leading scholars, researchers and practitioners in the field of civic learning and democratic engagement. Today's presentation is divided into two parts. We have our guest speaker, Wendy Burl Weinkoop. And then afterwards, we will go into a deep dive where Kimberly and I will take those of you who are interested in talking um, about some of the things that Wendy did in more detail. Uh, there are three guiding frameworks for today's session. Uh, we are here to advance an understanding of the intersection between equity, uh, agency, uh, and civic engagement to promote the public good. We're also recognizing the civic community and democratic engagement, um, or recognizing, uh, I should say, civic community and democratic engagement as a high impact practice for guided pathways and student success. And we're also leveraging participants' current knowledge to build capacity uh, to innovate for local, national, and global change. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kimberly, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Patty. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I guess I have the pleasure of introducing Wendy. She is a faculty lead dedicated to advocating for California community colleges, inspired by the Girl Scout motto, make this world our place. She leads her students and colleagues by example to expand and improve educational opportunities for all students in the California community colleges through developing new opportunities, learning modalities, and curriculum and career education Disedication and non credit. She honed her skills as an adjunct professor teaching art and graphic design at the University of California, Irvine, Pepperdine University, California State University, Dominguez Hills, and California State University, Fullerton. Initially, Chafee College made her fall in love with community colleges and focused her energy there. As a professor at the College of the Canyons for the past 25 years, she has worked to affect change for students in the next generation. She's a dedicated faculty advocate and has represented faculty on numerous college-wide governance committees and served as the union president. She graduated from the Community College Association of California Leaders Academy and the National Education Association Emerging Leaders Academy. On the statewide level, she serves as president of the Faculty Association for California Community Colleges. Wendy obtained her bachelor's of fine arts degree from the University of Southern California and she completed her graduate work at California State University Fullerton, earning a master's of fine arts degree in fine arts. She brings a wealth of experience in art and technology to the college and uses her creative problem-solving skills in her role in statewide advocacy. 
She is ready to face future challenges as the California Community Colleges continue to be a nationwide leader in higher education. Thank you so much for being here and welcome, Wendy. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I guess you gave me a great uh, intro, so I don't need to really introduce myself. Um, but I am serving as the uh, statewide president for FAC. And so I will talk a little bit about FAC. And then I chose to really focus uh, my remarks today sort of on uh, you know, what sort of threats the community colleges are under and why it's important to our students to sort of to make sure that we're advocating and protecting our California community colleges. So with that, I am going to share my screen and looking for somebody to say it worked. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so um, I would prefer if uh, I have, I don't have a ton of slides, only have about 20 of them. If I could go through the slides first and sort of uh, make my argument, and then um, you know, based on that, then we'll have questions after. It's just a little easier for me in terms of flow. And then I'm not great about paying attention to the chat with everything else going on on the screen. So um, I'll sort of bulldoze through my slides, and then and then we'll go to have a conversation if that's okay with everybody. So I do want to start a little bit uh, with FAC and uh, what it is. FAC is a faculty association of the California Community Colleges. Um, it is a professional membership organization, meaning that it exists because faculty members and administrators, believe it or not, <laughs> pay dues <laughs> uh, to the organization. And we have a mission to inform, educate, empower, and advocate for faculty in service to our students. So faculty do not exist without our students. Um, that's why we do it. None of us are here without our students. Um, and FAC was organized by a group of faculty from um, the Long Beach area in 1953. So this is our 70th year. Um, and in that time, uh, FAC primarily does two main things. We do professional development for faculty, and then we also um, are advocates in Sacramento, meaning we have a registered lobbyist and we work in that legislative space. And the faculty back in 1953 really knew that it was important to have a separate faculty voice in Sacramento, making sure that we watch legislation and help shepherd legislation through that would be beneficial to our system and our students. Um, part of that legislation that they helped to shepherd, just two sort of main pieces. Back in 1976, they were, FAC was instrumental in helping um, create the public employee unions um, in California, specifically the unions in Ed Code in law or California Code in law uh, have the scope of compensation and working conditions. So our unions, which have grown uh, quite a bit since uh, 1976, and we are a very strong union state, um, definitely in, this, in the uh, advocacy space, um, help shepherd and watch legislation in the, the that sort of scope of working conditions and compensation. And then last week, uh, we heard from um, Ginny May, a good friend of mine who's president of the ASCCC or the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, who talked a lot about the shared governance model in the California Community Colleges, which gives the ability for faculty and students and others to have the voice in our governance system so that we're not just you know, a, a top-down approach. Um, if you want an example, uh, the sort of the opposite example, you can look at what's happening in Florida right now uh, with a governor that's able to really just delete curriculum with the stroke of a pen. So the ASCCC's role in faculty specifically is what we call the 10 plus one, and that's mostly curricular matters. And I would refer uh, you guys to the recording that Ginny May did last week uh, in the Civic Dialogues, which really, really beautifully sort of broke down the shared governance system uh, in the California Community Colleges. But that piece of legislation that created shared governance, that was FAC. FAC was a co-sponsor of that legislation and really helped make that happen. So I think in the 70 years that FAC has been around, uh, we're not as well known. <laughs> we sort of the Senate and the unions have sort of grown in visibility and FAC is still here um, and FAC is still fighting for our students and for our faculty. 
So um, I wanted to start a little bit about myself. And this is um, me and my two brothers at the time and my mom. And I think it's back in the late 1970s. And I want to tell you a little about my own story. And I'll start by recognizing and acknowledging my own privilege. You know, I haven't had to deal with racism because of the color of my skin. But I also understand that my story and my story might not resonate with everybody, but my story does shape who I am and why I strive to be an ally um, for all my students. Um, but my story is the familiar immigrant story. So just two generations ago, my great grandparents fled uh, Europe due to famine and anti-Semitism and were seeking new opportunities. And fast forward into 1972, my mom, who is a first generation college student herself, uh, found that she was a single mother of three children under the age of six. And that wasn't something that she had ever intended for her life, to be uneducated and a single mom with three kids. That's not, that, that wasn't her plan, but that's what ended up happening. So, so what, so, you know, what happened? Well, in California, we have this amazing, particularly at that time, a uh, system of higher education. And she went back to school and became a doctor uh, with three little kids. She had student housing. It was practically free for her to attend UCLA. Um, and that really changed everything and the trajectory for our family. And because of her ability to go and get a medical degree with three small kids, all her children went to college. We all have higher ed degrees. We were all able to move into the middle class or even upper middle class for some of her children. Um, but none of us, not even my mom, was born with experience, knowledge, and, or the connections. We're not uh, born into wealth. We're not born into knowing people and networking. But, we, but through education, we were able to obtain those. Um, I became a teacher because somebody told me I'd be a great teacher. I remember who it was. It was my faculty member at USC and I was sitting outside in the sunshine sort of resting, having lunch and he came by and he sat down and we just sort of started chatting. And he's like, what are you gonna do with your life? And I said, I don't know. And he said, you'd be a great teacher. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna be a great teacher, right? Somebody told me that. I ran for the faculty Senate because somebody told me I'd be a great Senator. I ran for union leadership because somebody told me I'd be a great union leader. And I even ran as fact president because somebody told me I would be a great president. So every, every opportunity I've had, I've had a mentor right there that said, go for it. You have the power to make change. So I think about who I am and what I do and what's important to me and what I value. And education is instrumental to democracy. Good, good, good citizens need to understand the common good and why we have to focus on the common good. I value opportunities that education provided for my family. I want my children, my students, and future generations to have the same opportunities I had. And we need to ensure there's free, not just public education, but free public higher education for everybody, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And I want to acknowledge that we have to reconcile that our democracy was founded on the genocide of Native Americans and uh, was really built on enslaving people of color. And we're still wrestling with that as a country. Um, we have some systemic structures that really keep us from having a true democracy. And I think um, a lot of the last few years, and I'm going to circle back to that, have really been about challenging ourselves as Americans and who we are and how we, how we really break down some of those systemic barriers that we've created. But in the community colleges, we need to protect our students' opportunities to gain that experience, that knowledge, and those connections so that they have social and economic mobility. And stu students often know what they need and we value helping them reach their goals. And the community colleges, we take the top 100%, right? And our mission's broad. Whatever you need, whether you need remediation, whether you need to transfer, whether you need to gain one little tiny skill or you need, you need to transfer, we've got you. 
Um, these are some of my students, of course. And then I just wanna point out the one in the bottom left, that's my husband who decided to go back to school and become a teacher. So he didn't have a bachelor's degree. And um, we had, as you can see, Abby and Katie are little, now they're in college. And so, you know, he quit working and I worked twice as hard with two babies to get him through college. So, and it did change our lives. So I just point out that there's a personal story here that connects. So uh, there is a threat, right? And the threat is that our enrollment is declining and our community colleges have changed dramatically. Um, and it has been happening since before the pandemic. <clears throat> the pandemic, and you can see in this chart that we start to see a drop in our enrollment. So if we're taking 100% of students and providing education from the smallest skill to ESL, GED, C, CTE, and transfer, you know, we're an important asset in the state for that social and economic mobility. Why is our enrollment falling? And what is the threat? Well, first of all, we're the least funded um, system of public education in the state. We get about $7,000 per student when the UCs and CSUs get twice that. And uh, the K-12 gets about 50% more than that. Um, we have the largest reach of higher education. We're the largest system of higher education in the world. Uh, we have the most affordable tuition. We have open admission policies. We have flexible course schedules and learning modalities. We have 116 convenient locations in the state, and we take everybody again from high school students all the way up to uh, older adults. But our enrollment's down, and our legislature, and I can tell you this because I operate in the legislative space, has been asking, why do you need more money if enrollments are down? Your enrollments have dropped, so we should take money away. So as many of, many of you are aware, and some of you might not be aware, that there has been policy that has dramatically transformed our community colleges in the last decade. And some of those policies, I think, have unintended consequences of, of blocking access to public education. So I would say that there's a couple reasons our enrollment's down, and I wanna talk about those. But that's the threat. We have to figure out how we can make sure that our colleges are protected and available for students. These are two slides that a friend of mine, uh, Debbie Klein, who was a former president of uh, FAC, um, created. And the first one shows the head counts of the California Community Colleges. That giant peak in the top there, that's the last recession, right? So when we have a recession, um, typically we get a lot more students. Um, you can see there's a pretty dramatic drop from that height all the way down to 2012-13 when we sort of came out of the recession and then we started to do a little bit of a climb and then it sort of dives off again with uh, just before COVID. And then if you look at the California population, it goes up. Now we've heard a lot about, oh, our, our, our high school population's down. So that's why our community college enrollment is falling. But again, we do a lot more than just uh, uh, high school students straight out of high school looking for a transfer pathway or career tech. Um, this is another slide that uh, I created with Ginny May. We have an article on enrollment decline and we have a paradox of sort of some of the policies that have been implemented and um, and enrollment decline. So we've we've been asked by the legislature to reduce time to completion and unit accumulation. We've also been told by the legislature to change the way we provide remedial education. Both of those have led to enrollment decline because when you, de when you uh, reduce unit accumulation, and we have, and you also try and streamline that path to transfer so students aren't picking up classes they don't need, um, and then you also say, we don't need to put you on a four or five pathway class to get to transfer level math and English. All of that means units and all less units means less enrollment. So I wanna point out that our legislature is saying, why is your enrollment down? 
And if it's down, you don't need as much money. Yet at the same time, many of the policies that they have passed, the legislation they've passed, has created a decline in enrollment. So we're doing exactly what we're being asked to do. And there is a threat of losing money because we're helping our students reach their goals in a timely manner, and which is a good thing, right? That's a good thing that we help our students reach their goals. It's a good thing that we help move them through our system as best we can. We also wanna make sure that the point of education is to grow better humans, right? Democracy benefits from students who acquire any amount of education, period, any amount. And the more you acquire, usually the better your citizens are, the better they can critically think. So we need to be careful that we are not rationing access to education, that we are making sure that we protect education, that it is there as something that somebody can come back to again and again and again and continue to grow better humans, not just shove them through, right, from one point to another and then they don't come back to revisit um, education. And the other thing that I wanna mention is that our policies are really based on full-time students, uh, many of these policies that have passed. So I'll take guided pathways as an example. Much of the work we've done around guided pathways is based on a two-year model to move to transfer. So clarify that pathway so students can move from, from the day they set foot on campus onboarding through transfer. Um, but the majority of our students are part-time. The majority of our students take six or less units, six or less units, yet we have many, many two-year pathways for our students, and we're offering classes in a two-year pathway cycle that might not really work for many of our students. And this slide is from um, a recent survey, statewide survey that was done by the chancellor's office. And I believe the RP group helped with it. And all the colleges were asked to send out, and I can give you a link to the, the larger survey if you want, but this is one that resonates with me. So the top reasons previously enrolled students dropped classes. So why did they drop classes and not re-enroll? They had to prioritize work, they had to prioritize their mental health. They could not keep up with the pace of classes. They needed to care for dependents. They could not afford course materials and they could not learn in an online environment. Now, many of these we're not necessarily addressing as a system. We might have a basic needs center. We might, might offer some more mental health um, appointments. But systemically, we're not trying to tackle these. We're not trying to figure out how to solve these problems for students. So in other words, no amount of policy to clarify a pathway is going to fix these issues for our students. It's got to be a broader thing that we attack in order to help our students survive. And again, the reason we need them to do that, right? The reason we need to protect education is so that we have those better humans who are better citizens to make sure our democracy survives. Um, but they are wrestling, literally wrestling with many life circumstances and just trying to keep their heads afloat. That's what this slide is saying. They're just trying to keep their heads afloat. And one of the major barriers to transfer is place bound students, which also shows up on this slide. I think in talking to the legislature and in looking at many of our policies that have been put through in the recent years, there's an, a sort of a thought that most of our students are 18 years old, they go to school full time, and they can uh, get through the GE pathway or their AA degree in two years, which would be 15 units a semester, by the way, most of our uh, pathways are 12. Uh, the definition of a full time student is 12 units, which would not get you through in two years, it would have to be 15. So the idea is that they're full-time students, they're 18 years old, they get through in two years and then they transfer. When the reality is the majority of our students or the average age for our students is 25 years or older, um, I think something like 60% have dependents um, and they uh, something like 80% have a full-time job or the equivalent. And so they cannot just up and leave one place to go to another to transfer. 
So our placebound students are students who are living often in urban areas like San Diego area, Bay Area, Los Angeles, and our UCs and CSUs are impacted in those areas, meaning they don't have room for our students. And so for our students in order to transfer, they would have to transfer to a more remote or further away college and they simply can't. So this is something we haven't really dove into in policy is how do we make sure that students can continue their education? One of the great wins that we've had recently is expanding bachelor's degree programs at the community colleges so that they can stay where they are and continue their education. Okay, this is where I might get a little controversial. So this is a slide I made a little while ago um, and I call them special interest groups, which might offend some people. I know it does because I've, I've heard it, but I don't care. So nonprofit special interest groups. These are groups that are corporate funded um, and really their main objective is to change educational policy and divert public funds to private, um, private education or to uh, sell a piece of tech or to um, create, move the public money to a different place. So they are, um, you have a corporation. Um, I'm, I'm like Bill and Melinda Gates, or so the Gates, Microsoft. You have a corporation, Microsoft. Microsoft gives money to its own nonprofit organization like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That is a tax break right? You don't have to pay taxes when you do that. So then Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is, has an enormous amount of money, can either uh, um, offer grants to other organizations or they can change policy on their own as a nonprofit. They often create a research report that identifies some sort of problem like, hey, California Community Colleges, you have 2.8 million students total but only 60,000 of them transfer per year. You're doing a horrible job. So we have, we've identified a problem and we, this is, we have a solution. We're going to uh, sponsor legislation in the state legislature. And then we're going to very smoothly pass that piece of legislation. And often the solutions are not necessarily the correct solutions, and so what happens is then we get another piece of legislation on top of that. So the nonprofit, these nonprofit advocacy groups um, have enormous amounts of money. They have many, many very skilled lobbyists. Um, their policy messages are messages that are really hard to argue with, often in the name of equity, improving equity, equitable, um, equity goals, their, their message might be that um, we need to improve transfer, um, we need to uh, shorten the remedial pathway. All of these are great goals. Nobody is arguing with the goals that aren't good goals, but often it's accompanied with messaging that somehow we're failing our students. And that's one of my biggest gripes. Like, I don't think we're failing our students. I think we're working as hard as we can. Um, and then it's often, we have this sort of double messaging that faculty or, in, or or educational institutions are failing our students. And then there's a message of equity behind this piece of policy that they're trying to pass. And so we have this conundrum of trying to argue against the policy, which sounds like we're arguing against equity. Doesn't work very well. Um, the solutions, we often hear uh, the solutions that they propose in legislation are often about applying corporate efficiency models to humans. And one of the things we hear a lot about is maximizing the throughput. That's an example that was used in AB 705 and 1705. Humans, we don't maximize throughput of humans. That's a widget, right? That's something that we put in a factory. Um, and that was language that started with the industrial Re revolution that we, we can't maximize the throughput of a human in education. And, hu and education is about growing better citizens and educating people and having them revisit material to the point that they can understand it, learn it and do something with it. Often their solutions are technology can provide a solution to scale and make something more accessible. And those tech solutions are often inexpensive in the beginning and then start to increase in price. 
um, which which un, then again becomes a funding issue for the California Community Colleges. Um, Canvas is one of those examples. We had Canvas is practically free when we got it. It's starting to ratchet up the price, and I think we're going to see some problems with it coming up. Um, accountability is a huge piece. So holding everybody accountable for the money that they're getting. And uh, you know, how do you make a college accountable for, again, humans who have, I remember the slide just two slides ago about all those things students are wrestling with. And then we've become data driven, not data informed, right? So they look at the data and then they use the data to drive a decision as opposed to using the data to inform us and make us understand what we need to do. So we've seen this sort of pri privatization in many areas of public services and public services shouldn't be privatized because everybody relies on them to exist, right? So our citizens rely on public services, but the healthcare system, I think most of us have uh, realized there's major problems with healthcare, utilities, examples in Texas of literally the utilities being turned off. Um, emergency services is another one, the military and so on. So. Lots of examples here, and we could spend another two hours on this, so I'm going to move on. But I want you to think about who's paying for these policies. You know, are there other motivations? And what are these groups not advocating for, right? What are they not asking for? Um, and I can say that, you know, they're not asking for more money for our system. They're not advocating for financial aid for our students. They're not advocating for health care for our students. They're not advocating for student housing for our students. They're not advocating for basic needs for our students. So we get more and more mandates on things. And again, um, I'll just click back to it. This is what our students are, are saying that they're having trouble with and all of these policies that have been um, push through, don't address what they need. Um, some of the groups, um, just some of them, there's many, um, but Gates Foundation is probably top of the list. It's tech, they make money off tech solutions. Lumina is student loans. They're huge. They wrote our vision for success document in the California Community Colleges that was actually written by Lumina. Pushes transfer. When students transfer, they take out loans. So does that mean Lumen is evil? No, but they do make their money off student loans. And so often these policies have other sort of uh, uh, um, consequences to them. Um, ECMC is another one in the game. That's student loan debt collection. Um, Walmart uh, is Ed Trust West. They give a lot of money to Ed Trust West and so on. So, uh, I, I have this slide from something else which has more context, but I'll, I'll describe it verbally. So in the center, you have the chancellor's office and the board of governors, right? That's sort of the, the regulatory system of our, um, of our uh, California community colleges. And then the pink is system practitioners. So that's faculty, that's students, that's administration, that's staff. That's those who work in the system who are closest to the students and understand how the system works and what our students need. And then you have the special interest groups that are sort of surrounding that. Um, I think that what has happened particularly is that with our California Community College Chancellor's Office Foundation, many of the special interest groups are also within the foundation. And you've seen that blue band, which is sort of separated, become really close to the chancellor's office. And there's really a very, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to uh, um, see the difference between the two. We have a new chancellor coming in. We'll have to see how things change. But definitely when we had Eloy Oakley, there was a marrying of the special interest groups and the chancellor's office policies to the point that it was very difficult to see any difference between the two. Um, and, you know, difference, uh, that that separation is important that we don't have private the private sector controlling our public institutions. Um, this is a slide of uh, just over a decade of reform. So if you want to know every single detail of these, call me up. We'll have lunch. I'll go through every single one with you. <laughs> and I also have um, a slide deck that that talks about some of these. Um, but this is like a two hour conversation on its own. But I think just seeing the magnitude of the amount of policy that has gone through in the last decade, 
the, for the most part, the focus on all of these policies is improving transfer. So making the community colleges junior colleges were those two years between high school and the four years focused on the general education pathway get them in get them out that's the junior college model so this is about sort of changing our mission narrowing our mission of the california community colleges to make it focused on improving transfer we are under incredible initiative fatigue from all these mandates we have not had more resources at all to do all this work those of us who work in the community colleges have felt the pressure of this. Um, there are unintended consequences where we, we spend a lot of time focusing our limited resources on one part of the mission and then other parts of the mission end up suffering. Um, so what are they not advocating for? I said this before, but I make sure I hit the list. We don't have an increase per student funding. We're, they're not advocating for the total cost of college not advocating for the health care of our students, not advocating for a living wage with on-campus jobs so our students can stay connected to our campus and we can help mentor them while they're there. They have to go to Starbucks and then they have to go over to Walmart, you know, and work 40 hours a week. Um, we're not advocating for student basic needs, particularly the cost of housing, mental health, a capacity for our specific community college students to transfer to the UCs and CSUs. So we have this associate degree for tra transfer pathway that starts in 2010, but it's not a true guarantee to where students can go to. Um, they don't advocate for uh, establishing a sense of belonging on campus. They don't advocate for bachelor's degrees at community college, which we could do for about $11,000 total for a degree. Um, they don't advocate for supporting full-time faculty. So part-time faculty, we have an over-reliance on part-time faculty in our system. And then there's no resources to do this work. Uh, just to give you an idea, the blue is the total amount of higher education bills per year that are proposed by the legislature. And the orange are those that have actually passed. So we have about 80 bills on average per year, per year, that change, that are successful, that change our California community colleges for the last five years. The little bump below is 2020, it died because of COVID, but it's way back up this year. So an enormous amount of mandated changes to our system. And this is from the chancellor's office, No, almost no change in equity, right? A decade, a decade of mandates but very little change in equitable gap in change, closing those equity gaps, which is exactly what all the legislation and policy shifts have intended to, um, to do. So um, I, I was talking to some folks last week about this idea of the myth uh, or, or apathy that our students are apathetic, you know, that they're not engaged civically, that they don't, they're not interested in voting, that they don't want to change the world, that they just, you know, and I, I think there's a myth here of apathy. I don't think that they're apathetic. I think they're exhausted and I think they're just trying to survive, really. But I do think they are motivated. And I think there's a few examples of absolute incredible power of how unapathetic they are. The uh, one on the top left is the uh, March for Our Lives, the high school students organizing against anti school violence. Um, the bottom one is the Women's March in 2017, and then in 2020, we witnessed a call to action about breaking down systemic barriers, right, when it came to the, after uh, the George Floyd uh, murders. So um, that extraordinary, extraordinary show of power in some worldwide, like the March for Lives and uh, um, the 2020 protests were uh, national. And then uh, international, sorry. And then you also see, which I could add to this list, climate action, right? Enormous protests and enormous uh, mobilization about um, climate change. So unfortunately, we see this show of power and then we don't see much change. And there's a difference between sort of activism and mobilizing and then actual organizing. 
And so in order to, what do we do now? Like what I've given you all this, you know, stuff, you're like, God, I feel miserable, Wendy, what do we do? Well, I think it's about, we have to go back to this idea of community, right? And it's about community and to bring back community into community colleges because that 10 years of legislative mandates have been about making us junior colleges. They've been about reducing our mission. We need to go back to our mission of we're here for the whole community. We're here to educate the whole community. We have to literally meet students where they're at for what they need, not what we tell them they need, right? And we need to do that through community organizing. So I would make the argument that, you know, community art organizing really is about building power towards a goal. And when we all just show up angry and mad and blow off steam, well, we don't have a specific goal in mind and we're not organized towards that goal, then often we can't make movement. So as a system of the California Community Colleges, you know, we have to come up with a collective goal and we need to figure out what is it that we need to protect? What is it that we need to happen? And how are we gonna make that happen? Um, I did use an example of community organizing earlier today. <laughs> when I started, I started with my story. And then I talked about the story of us as community colleges. And then I talked about the story of now which is, you know, what is the threat and how are we gonna fix it? That is a technique by Marshall Gans. Um, and uh, that's just one technique of community organizing and there's many. Um, this is another example. It's uh, by uh, Jane uh, Mappalevy, who is a community organizer and she and her techniques were used for the UTLA strike, the United Teachers Los Angeles strike a couple years ago and then again, for the strike that they just uh, showed, I guess it wasn't a strike, it was a work, uh, work action um, with uh, SEIU um, and was successful. And the reason that the teachers joined SEIU was because uh, the SEIU, many of those members didn't get close to a living wage. They're making 25,000 or 30 a year um, for full-time work as a union member, as a public servant. So when we join together um, in collective action, then we can make change, right? So our students aren't apathetic. We're not apathetic, we're angry. You can move that anger into action, but you need to be organized. So um, building power through relationships, having strategic campaigns, having conversations one-on-one -on -one to gain trust, create spaces where we can trust each other, um, build coalitions and solidarity throughout our communities. Um, this is the, the Marshall Gans, just one strategy or technique. So these are things that we can teach our students. These are things that we can teach ourselves across the system. We can have organizing classes and curriculum so that students understand what it is and how to use it. Um, I love this quote by uh, David Bowie. And these children that you spit on as they try and change their worlds, they're immune to your co consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. What are our students facing? And uh, Patty and I were just talking about this a little bit before we went live. You know, they grew up in the wake of 9-11 and the Great Recession, climate threat, literally threatening whether they'll be able to survive on this planet, um, school violence, COVID, uh, in income inequality, lack of affordable health care and housing, student debt, racism, trans and homophobia, a sense of immort. I remember when I was a kid, I had at this age, I had a sense of immortality. And when I talk to young people, they don't have a sense of immortality. They have a sense of mortality and fear, which is a complete shift in just two generations. Um, I asked some of my students, what do you need to be engaged? And this is what I heard most. They need to feel that their efforts can make change. They want to make change. They don't know how to make change. They want to make change, but they need to feel that if they're going to do something, that it's going to work. And again, community organizing requires that goal and a campaign to build power to reach that goal. Um, they need to hear a message from somebody they trust. They trust faculty, they trust teachers, right? And they need to hear it from us. 
Um, they look for authenticity and connection. They're dying for connection in other human beings, right? Humans love other humans. We, we do, we love connections. Um, they want equal reward for equal work, which is a really interesting thing because when I ask my students, like, why don't you get involved? They say, well, I'm working 40 hours a week and I'm taking care of my younger brother or my grandmother. So if we want them to take action, we might have to consider funding the work, right? Which there are colleges that have done this, like the LA Community College District has interns, student interns that they pay to do advocacy. So how could we grow? And so does De Anza, and so does um, Delta, I believe, college. So how can we as a system maybe create something where our students uh, can actually be funded to do the work to help organize our system? Um, and then we need to make spaces for students. And we have safe space things on our offices and we have lots of spaces at college, I think. But those also need to include, according to my students, social media spaces or virtual spaces so that they connect online, like Discord is a big one for them, right? So how do we make spaces that are not just the spaces that maybe my generation understood, but spaces that they also understand? Um, this is something that just happened in the last week. I don't know if anybody heard about it, but I have, not only do they need those things, but they also need cool merch, which I think is merchandise, which I think is a great um, example of how we have to think differently when we think about organizing with young people. And I'm almost done, by the way, because I know I'm going long. But this is the uh, American Red Cross uh, decided that if you came in and gave blood, that they would give this Snoopy t-shirt out. And so they did a collaboration with, uh, with uh, the trademark for Snoopy. And they literally have too much blood now. They had to close appointments. And they sold out or they ran out of shirts. And it was like literally in two weeks. So they went from like dangerously low blood supply to, oh my God, now what do we do? We've got too much. And it was all over uh, a shirt. But you, we have to think about what motivates people to get involved. And maybe it's a shirt, but maybe they stay there because we're able to connect with them and be authentic and help them understand how they can do even more than just donate blood and maybe save one life one day, right? But you can save multiple lives, multiple days. So, you know, our call to action is we need to organize. We need to get our stakeholders, not special interest groups, but the stakeholders. That means faculty, staff, administration, um, students involved in leading our community college system. We need to be the leaders, not somebody else, us. And that means a lot of things, a lot of work, but participating locally in committees and governance first, again, students, faculty, staff, everyone, be a member or union or clubs, um, form coalitions with other community-based organizations, which I love the project-based learning, which Patty has been a champion of, which I think is a, a great example of that. Um, invite students, families, and other stakeholders to engage and develop specific um, a specific campaign. What, what legislation do we wanna propose that would have the right solutions? And then I think we need to reform Prop 13 because that started the underfunding of our uh, public education system in California. Um, this is a photograph from the March and March, which was back in the great recession. And we had this model, we had organizing, we sent up hundreds of people to Sacramento on the same day from all the colleges to, uh, to ask for more money. And I love this sign that says, no education, no jobs, no money, no future. And this is you know from 2009, I think, this image. So we're still in the same place, but how can we move forward past that? And then I will also just mention that I think one of the reasons that the UTLA strike and the recent work action with, with SEIU was so successful is that uh, they did involve the community. They pivoted to community organizing. They brought in the parents. They made the argument that, you know, uh, staff and faculty working conditions are student learning um, conditions. And when you marry those two together, you marry that idea that this, it is about the community and we all uh, you know, protect education and rise together or we all fail together. So it's about, you know, putting the selfishness aside and making sure as a community we respect 
Um, we respect that. Okay, I'm gonna stop that. Oh, probably, did I lose anybody? <laughs> You're all still here. <laughs> Oh, Wendy, that was absolutely wonderful. I um I was taking a bunch of <laughs> shots of of the the different things that you were pulling up, um some some screenshots, but um there were so many great things that you 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 talked about and that just kept resonating with me. And and I I love the fact you were bringing in the work of Marshall Gans, the idea of community organizing, you know. And it's and it's really interesting because I've had this conversation with folks, and. For some folks, that idea of community organizing just makes them bristle. It's like, oh my gosh, you're talking about going out and picketing or protesting or doing this or this or this. It's like, no, the organizing can take many different forms, but it's that ability to bring people together. And as you were showing, you know, having them look at themselves, there's that storytelling that happens. There's that idea of how you get connected with each other and you you decide what is that common thread. That, that links you together. And I think you were doing such a great job of that today, showing you know the, the kinds of things that our young people are struggling with, that for many of us who are older, these were not the kinds of things that we had to struggle with. And especially your, your one comment, which I've had this conversation and I, you said it so well, um, that we, we never had to deal with the idea or the concept of mortality. We didn't fear mortality. But because for many of us as young people, we thought we were immortal. But for many young people today, they do see their lives as, my gosh, I don't know if I will be able to live until I'm this age or that age. I don't know if the planet will still be in existence. So I think just that that example that you were giving was so, so powerful. But um, I just want to say thank you. And I'm, I'm going to open it up because, um, again, I just wrote down so many things that you were talking about. But I, I know we've got folks who have questions. Um, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Hi. We, uh, I know Wendy. I work with Wendy. Uh, so let's go. Let's do it. Let's develop let's a it. campaign <laughs> and uh, set some goals of what we want to accomplish. And with the idea in mind of our students, uh, forming of alliance with our students and put out our vision of community college, develop specific goals, a campaign, start organizing. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm with you. Okay. Okay. All right. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right there. I, okay. I've said my piece. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Tamara. Hey, Wendy. I just want to say thank you. It's good to uh, see you. You I miss you. you <laughs> um, this whole week, of course, COC is on spring break, but the the full timers in the department, anyway, we're offline chatting constantly this week of um, thinking of ways to you know help the department. So I'm thinking smaller scale, but everything you were talking certainly resonated with stuff that we were talking about. And I, like Patty, was taking pictures of all your slides. So I hope you don't mind me using them in the department meeting. Um, but I think to organizing, like you're talking about on a much larger scale, but we were just talking about in comms. I mean, I was thinking, how can we help enrollment there? How can we reach our students better? And you were talking about, um, I mean, social media is out there, but I love the t-shirt idea. I mean, talk about basics, right? It's like, well, why not? I mean, when I went to school, every single club you can imagine had their own t-shirt. Um, the question is, you know, do they have the money? Probably not. Well, if we can have the funds of, in the department, which I'm sure we can find them somewhere to help maybe the comms majors um, have at least a shirt that, that they wear on the day of the meetings. And you know, just stuff like that to show, I think, too, that the faculty are, we're not separate from them. I think that was the key message, that we are in this with them. Um, when you talked about sharing your story, um, um, I try to do that as often as possible, but not as, not in, as in depth as you did. And I was thinking, why don't I? Because I'm such an open and shut person. It's like, you can talk to me about anything. And I think it's important. I know that when you do share your stories with, with students, that's when they gravitate to you. That's when they latch on. That's when they care about 
you know, this isn't just depending if it is about the class, it's not just a lecture class anymore. It's, I want to be there, like you said, because I trust you and I want to hear what you have to say. Um, we all know, and this is something that we're going to talk in a department meeting very soon is it's not lecture anymore. You know, we got to get away from that word. I think, um, lecture classes, like it, it, to me, it's very negative. It's, it's, a conversation class. It's it's uh, dialogues, and it's not teacher to student, which we all know, right? But it's all of us, and so I think leveling that playing field, like you were just talking about, whether it's community to um, the uh, institution or um, faculty to student on a much smaller scale, I think that's so important. So I just want to thank state. Thank you. Um, to kind of boosting my spirits about it all because <laughs> certainly when you have these conversations they're so negative and it just seems like oh I'm never going to get to that level or the next step or I don't want it to be a session of complaints I want it to be a session of of caring and problem solving if we can do that so thank you I appreciate that you're welcome and it's always good to see you <laughs> Hi, Joseph. Hi. I just wanted to follow up on what Andrew said. I think we need to come up with a strategy of how we're going to work with the incoming chancellor. Because the yeah. problem is, is if we don't have a strategy, we don't have a plan, it could go in a direction that we would say, how did this happen? Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And she is... Um... She is uh, on the board for the Campaign for College Opportunity, who've been behind an enormous amount of these policies. And the Board of Governors for the California Community College has been very clear that they want to stay on this idea of the vision for success. So I don't think that we're going to change course immediately. Um, but I do think that we need to start communicating some of the unattended consequences. And the answer should be yes and, right? So. I know that like I've seen, I was trying to read some in, in the chat and I didn't get through all of it, but there was a, I know that AB 705 and 1705 make people really mad and faculty particularly, because essentially what we've done is remove remediation from the California community colleges. And actually in September of 2022, it was actually removed from ed code in our mission. They, they're through budget trailer bill language, which is just not very lacking in transparency. So I think as faculty, we need to start saying yes and. It's an improv technique, but we need to say yes and. Like, can we get the majority of students directly into transfer and through? Yes. And we need to also make sure that we have courses for that. that, that if that doesn't work for some students, we need to make sure that we preserve the courses that work for the other students. So it's about student choice and making sure that we can help our students meet their goal in a timely manner, right? So I think we need to practice instead of pushing back and saying, no, 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 we need to say yes, and how can we get that done without having unintended consequences? Kimberly. Hi, Wendy, so much of what you said is resonating and I have so many thoughts. So I'm gonna to try to be clear with them. I was struck by the, the low enrollment numbers in particular and some of the narrative around that, because I've heard a lot of that too. Um, oh, well, you know, our high school population is declining. And so, and now we have the pandemic and there's a lot of things that are being said, but one thing that isn't is I think we were having this cultural war and it's at the crux of democracy and capitalism. Yep. I think there's plenty of youth who are questioning the value of spending the money to get a college degree because they only see it in that production model of capitalism. They don't see it as transformative. They don't see it as building our democracy, our citizenry, and what kind of citizen do they want to be and what kind of future do they want to build in the United States today. So when yep. they see these tech capitalists that are very young, that start college, drop out and make millions that's the new, I think for a lot of youth, of course, I'm not speaking for everybody. That's kind of like the new model. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like it's kind of like the athletics for a while. We've had young athletes who said, well, I'm going to go be the next LeBron James. And you'll have to say, well, you know, maybe you should have a 
a backup plan because that's such a small portion of the population that actually reaches that mm -hmm. success in professional basketball. The same is true, I think, in the, this other world of, oh, I'm going to be a YouTube star or I'm going to be an influencer or whatever that is. I do think that we aren't talking about that enough mm -hmm. and, and how to shape instead of this push to transfer almost obsession with transfer without, you know, the ability or really restricting the ability to explore that is the cool part of going to college your first year or two for a lot of people. Some people are very focused, but some like to just explore. And what's wrong with that? Why is that such a bad thing? Just, you know, and I think you kind of tapped into it also with um, basic skills. You know, it was the darling of the campus 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. now people are looked at as how dare you participate in that, you know, um, that inequitable practice I think there are, you know, there are plenty of students I've talked to who actually want that choice. They want remedial classes. And so I, I think there is the truth and the sweet spot that lies between the two poles of all of this. And I think we get on these trends in higher ed and then we get so focused on them, blindly focused on them, we won't look at anything else. And it all kind of fits together in a post-pandemic paradigm shift that we're within higher education that no one has the answer. We're all trying to figure it out. But then I loved your idea and your, it's the truth of these lobbyists that come in to try to siphon those public funds. And that is very true. And I've seen a lot of it. And sometimes it's super hard to discern though, who is a lobbyist and a nonprofit trying to do that? And who's like the true genuine innovation that is meant to help students. So all of this, I think, takes more conversation and training for our own faculty as well. So I'll stop yeah. here. You surfaced a lot for me. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, there's it's so complex and I tried to bite it off in 40 minutes, but um, I'm hoping that we can keep those conversations going. But I do think who is the lobbyist or who who's funding it? I think you you need to look at where the money right. Follow the money and then then not only follow where the money's coming from to drive the change, but then follow the money where it goes after the change. Um, and I do think there is a huge component of the conversation about student debt and whether a bachelor's degree plus is worth it started a decade ago, just at the same time that Lumina started changing community college policy to be focused on transfer and Lumina makes their money off student loans, right? So I, I, you know, I've been called flat to my face, you're a conspiracy nut. Okay, fine. I will take that. Call me a nut if you want. But when we transfer students, the vast majority of students in order to pay for a bachelor's degree have to take out loans. And we do have Berman's AB 928, which is one of the bills on that list that passed in 2021, by fall of 2024, which is just a year away, we will be putting, mandated to put every single student on an ADT pathway, period. Now they can opt out, but they need to know to opt out. And honestly, many of our students don't know what an associate's degree is versus a bachelor's degree versus a CTE certificate. They're just here to explore and learn. And I think this idea of helping them meet their goals is great, but honestly, they are so stressed out by just the world that it's hard to even know what their goals are sometimes, you know? So the fact that like too much education is a bad thing is kind of like what I feel like a lot of these policies are pushing, like, you know, one and done, get them through. And that is the corporate efficiency part that you cannot apply to humans and education. Because if I just learned what I learned when I was 22, and then I never learned another thing, I would be a pretty awful person, I think. Anyway, um, Eduardo, is that Godzilla? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's not me, though. I'm not got to live it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just turn on my video because um, for some reason I get the, I don't know, like unstable <laughs> uh, connection. But yeah. Um, but no, yeah. Anyhow, um, yeah, a lot of your points were very sound. And I think in the first half of your presentation, like the charts about the student population among camp campus grounds really uh, 
uh huh, uh, I guess like uh huh, uh, captivated me because for as long as I could remember, uh, I've been a lifelong observer slash learner, but I would say I'm more of the former, um, because ever since I here in Southern California, I do recall when I went to a community college called Orange Coast, uh, college the foot traffic of students uh, was a lot more higher. And the word impaction in fall 2012 was also a thing that I feel doesn't even exist anymore because almost any student can get most of the classes that they need to be full-time um, status. And um, ever since fall 2019 and then the, uh, the, the incoming semester where the pandemic kicked in, I noticed that it, well, even before that, the uh -huh, like I told my supervisor, my instructional associate that the student population to me has really uh, uh, decelerated. And I'm like, I can't I can't be crazy for thinking that. But I start to, you know, cross reference other people's opinions to see if they reach a similar conclusion to me. And I have these conversations all the time with coworkers and some students alike that um, it seems that the, uh -huh, the value of higher education has completely uh, transformed uh, for a worse return. And I think it's quite of a shame or I guess unfortunate uh, that it's come to that. Uh, and the perspectives that I would hear from some students uh, of my own too, that they say that higher education is like a gamble uh, because they don't really know if the occupation or major that they finally graduate and if they even do land a job on it who they don't really know if they would like it or dislike it hmm. and given the the time the money of course and the the crazy energy that they have to output if all of that goes to waste then you know, some of these folks, these graduates live with regret and they choose another occupation that doesn't even align mm -hmm. with whatever it is that they studied. And I've even had like classmates too, uh, who um, once they took a semester gap or once they prioritized uh, work over their higher education, rarely they're not the same learner afterwards anymore or 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 worse yet, they don't return to school uh, or to college uh, till semesters after. But even then, their motivational level, it's not really the same anymore. And you could kind of make this analogous to a boxer, a professional boxer. And, and I think all of these sort of situational factors really, uh -huh, it, it makes it quite sad in my view. And I know for next week here in Orange Coast College, me and... Uh, other like um, co-teachers and co-tutors alike they're basically already going to prep up and revolt the I guess like the recent AB 1705 um because I've seen the firsthand that uh, that rule even though it's meant to expedite the graduation rate which I think is fine in theory but from the firsthand experiences that I've seen both in the learning resource center and in the classroom there are so many voids or deficiencies that the students don't are not really prepared for their English 100 or 101 English classes. And I feel like that's not really, I guess, the proper approach to, uh -huh, in theory, expedite the graduation rate. And I feel like it's only reinforced by what I've seen when I've uh, visited the learning, the tutorial resource center or from what I've heard from fellow instructors alike. But uh, yeah, I think um, with that being said, um, I guess for me, it's just, um, I'll go with um, whatever my, I guess my faculty peers uh, say. And we'll see, I guess, what, what time will tell really, even though I don't like to say that, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I think you, Eduardo, you touched on a lot of things, I think, there's a couple of things with the degree path, right? And first of all, we've getting a degree used to be again about growing better citizens, right? Education was about growing citizens who could participate in our democracy. It wasn't about a career. And we have hyper focused 
the point of a college education is to get a career, right? And so if you don't end up in, you know, I'm, I have to choose a major, like literally the day I set foot on campus. And then what if that isn't the major I want? And do I want to invest six years of my life and $150,000 if maybe I don't even want to be there? But I think it's worse than that because before the recession, uh, the Great Recession, I would say that, you know, having a bachelor's degree pretty much guaranteed a job, right? Maybe not the job that you thought you were going to get, but it guaranteed a job. And since the Great Recession, we have a lot of people with bachelor's degrees working at Starbucks, right? We just, so, so a BA doesn't, doesn't equal you're going to get a job we sort of still selling it that way but i think the problem is like like education is a bit, again about growing better humans to participate in our democracy and when we've linked it via these corporate right corporate ideas to a career pathway and getting a job is sort of where that went south but i agree with you any education is helpful and continued education is helpful if we're going to sort of make sure that we can participate in our democracy, make sure our democracy is available for everyone, not just the privileged, right? And it works for everybody. The other thing that you said about 1705 or, uh, and re remediation reform that I think I wanted to just mention is that it's measured on one thing, maximizing the throughput. And it's in the language, maximizing the throughput. And so what you do is you take two groups of students, one group that has maybe a one or two sequence remediation and then transfer, and then you have a group that has transfer. And you measure the completion metric in both of those. Mm -hmm. So if people are put directly into transfer and that group has a seven, you know, like a 57% pass rate, but this group has taken one class and then another class to get through has a 55% pass rate, so 2% difference. Then we're gonna, that's maximizing the throughput. That's how they decided that we needed to go with putting everybody in transfer. Mm -hmm. But here comes the conspiracy nut again. Um, first of all, somebody's gonna lose in that model, right? If you're gonna maximize the throughput, if you're gonna say everybody's gonna go into that basket because that way was, you know, 5% better than that way, you're saying that we, it's okay as a system of public education. It is okay with us that certain students are going to lose, that it doesn't work for 45% of our students. We don't give a shit. But here's the conspiracy nut part is that Ed Trust West, who is huge on getting rid of remediation, they were number one on the list in the advocacy space. They're funded by Walmart. So what does Walmart gain when 45% of our students can't access transfer. Cheap labor, cheap labor, that's what they get. It's literally 705 and 1705. Does it make it easier for some students to get through? Yes, but it also separates wheat from shaft. Those who can will, and those who can't no longer have an opportunity to maybe get through, right? We have decided that they're not going to get through. And if you wonder, where this crazy remedial pathway came from. It came from a piece of legislation, AB 1456, I think in 2012, the Student Success Act, I think it was Lowenthal. And that act made us assess students the second they put foot on campus. And in order to do that, there was a tech solution, which was AccuPlacer, and that created putting them you know, five levels down below. Faculty instantly noticed this is problematic and started to work for acceleration models, multiple measures, all of these ways that we could shorten that remedial pathway that was created by a piece of legislation that we did not sponsor or support in the first place. And that started to work towards 705. 705, the, the language of the law is not too bad. If you go back and read it, it's pretty good. It says we really should be able to get somebody through transfer in a year. I don't have a problem with that. It was the guidelines and regulations that came out of the chancellor's office after that were so restrictive. So mm -hmm. if you go back and read the language of AB 705, I think you'll be like, okay, I can't really argue with that. It was the Title V regulations, which I think is 55522. And then 1705 went slammed to the far side and said, okay, we're just going to get rid of remediation altogether. 
Yeah, I could talk about 1705 and 705 all day, but I'll leave it there. But mm -hmm. there are unintended consequences that ensure somebody will lose. And if we take 100% of students, that's not okay with me. That's mm -hmm. not okay with me. Mm -hmm. Right, right. True. I saw Richard's. Yeah, oh, Richard sorry, has his hand up. So three short comments. <clears throat> One going back to our new incoming chancellor who rather than referring to her as the chancellor, I'm just gonna say Sonia. It's worth always keeping in mind that Sonia is, I don't think unusual in this respect, very proud of her past and how she got to where she is. Her first job in the system was as a part-time math faculty at Bakersfield College. So she has her own memories of the challenges of students in developmental math courses and the more we can keep her conscious of her faculty memories and the students she worked with, the better. So that's one comment. Thank you. A second comment, Wendy, you talked about the challenges of students in Southern California and urban areas with transfer, but oh my God, is it harder if you are not in one of those urban places? So you talk about students being yeah, yeah. bound. Yeah. My college is Alan Hancock. <laughs> the CSU system, is arranged so that every college has a designated CSU that services them. Allen Hancock is very close to Cal Poly Slow, but Cal Poly is not a CSU, but a California Polytechnic, so they have no service area. We are in the service area for Channel Islands, which is over 100 miles yeah. away. Santa Maria's population is 70% Latino. Those students are not anxious to move to other parts of the state, and they're are no options. So I think from a student perspective, at least being in the LA Basin, it's hard to find a place there aren't three or four colleges within, you know, a grueling commute if you do it at the wrong time of day, but at least there are options that rural parts of the state lack. Yeah, you're right. And Lassen College is another one. I mean, like they're so far away from any CSU. And I think the closest one is over like 300 miles away. And this is why I think uh, being able to offer bachelor's degrees at the community college will be helpful, particularly in certain areas. And the CSUs are pushing back hard against our bachelor's degree programs, hard um, and in the legislative space. So that's something I think that we all need to be, but you're absolutely right. It's not just, place-bound students is not just a, uh, a, a city issue, urban air issue, absolutely. And I'm sorry if I in, uh, implied that it was just urban. I was using the example of the impacted programs as the urban example, but you're absolutely right, yeah. And then third, you made the comment in passing in one of the early slides um, that people on campuses know what the Senate is and know what their union is, but don't know what FAC is. I love the presentation, but we need to figure out how to get faculty to be more aware of members of reading the Saturday, reading the FAC email and um, shifting from that mode that democracy is, is a mechanism where you vote for somebody and then check out for four years um, to thinking that if you're checked out for four years, somebody else is not. And they're working the legislature and the chancellor's office and the board of governors to get what they want, whether it's good for you or your students or not. And I say that as a former FAC board member who um, has often encouraged colleagues to become members. And uh, I don't know if I had a stack of t-shirts, it would be easier, but if students like merch, I suspect <laughs> faculty may as well. And that- We and, have merch, I'll, I'll get you some. <laughs> all right. And that's, those are my comments. And, and Andrew, I'm gonna send you an email when we're done. I'd like to hear from you. That would be it'll <laughs> mutual. Um, I, I do want to say that uh, Richard is a, a former mentor of mine from 40 years ago. Um, and Wendy, you've inspired me a whole lot to uh, to get more active. In fact, I'm, I'm running for the board and um, you, you've this been a real you've been a mentor for me and I'm, oh, I'm thank 62 you. years old. So in any case, my students are my mentors. I listen to them all the time because they're going to be here longer than I'm going to be here. <laughs> oh, and I just want to say as someone who has known Wendy, I've been on campus for 24 years. And I think Wendy, you came in a year before I did. 
You mm -hmm. have been a powerhouse at College of the Canyons for years, and I am so excited and so happy that you're in the role that you are now because you've taken that kind of advocacy, that kind of passion that you have, um, and, and not only all the good things you've done on campus over the years, but now you're doing it at the state level, and um, I just want to say thank you because you're, you, you are a role model for all of us, so thank you. You're welcome. So You, you guys can all be leaders. Somebody will tell you right now, you can all be leaders. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Um, Wendy has been so gracious with her time here, and this is wonderful. Um, and I, I just want to say, I, I cannot support you enough when you talk about the issue of lobbyist <laughs> and corporate interest, because I've seen this, and um, I agree. We always have to take a look at why are those big foundations providing that money, because there's typically a reason and I hate to say it, I've seen this with Bill Gates. Um, I mean, has poured millions and millions of dollars into to education, but you also have to back off and say why. And a lot of that has gone into, quite frankly, creating a workforce for the kinds of things that he himself is interested in. And I, I, I don't mean to sound negative, but again, there's usually a reason. So you do have to be very, very careful and um, at least look at this kind of, of um, these kinds of donations and why this is happening or this kind of support. Um, there's usually a, another side to that story. Um, right. Well, that's why education's so important, right? Because you have to be able to evaluate a policy and see, like, is it wrong to uh, support any corporation? No, not necessarily. I mean, they Microsoft employs a lot of people mm -hmm. and has created jobs that have helped a lot of people. So, and we all use computers and it allows us to, I mean, right now, Microsoft, we can thank Microsoft for the ability to have this conversation online. So not everything is black and white, not everything's good or bad, not everything is wrong or right. We just have to figure out exactly when we implement policy, we need to make sure that faculty and students particularly are part of that conversation because if you look at it from that capitalist corporation view of corporate efficiency only, right? If that's the only lens, then there is an enormous amount of unintended consequences and it's very difficult to sort of right the ship. So I do think that, um, you know, we have uh, checked out a bit in between elections and, you know, for democracy to, um, to exist and to thrive, we really need our students engaged all the time. And I just know my students would be if they got the rewards they're seeking, if they saw the change that they wanted to see. And I think it takes, you know, again, they need to be able to see it. So if we say, oh, if you do this, it'll help up there at the state level, it's too difficult for them to understand. They need to see the change on their campus with their community. And that's what we need to do on each of our community college campuses. We need to show them how they can make change on their campus and then link it to their efforts to the state so they can then understand how the policy at the state level helps them. And, and one last thing I will say, and then Kimberly, please jump in here. Uh, and I love El Ed Eduardo's little dog, how cute. Um, one of the things that I think is also so important and someone, I think it was Andrew who brought this up, um, you know, it, you, you vote and then there's like the four year gap. And what we have to understand is that so much of, of what we're talking about with this kind of work in civic and community engagement, it's not just about the voting. Voting is an important part, but it's what we do, particularly in between those voting cycles. And it is that kind of work of getting, as, as, as when he's talking about organizing our students, making them feel that they're, they're giving back in such a way that they're, the kind of work that they're doing is connected to something larger and that it has a purpose. And if we're able to not only do that at the campus level, but also start to connect it to larger kinds of social issues, then that's where we start to see that change. So I think, again, just going back, this isn't something that's just one and done. It has to be ongoing. And again, the voting component is just one component of this larger, larger picture. Yeah, and just to add to that, Patty, I think, you know, you were onto something, Wendy, when like it's too big an ask to say, go to your legislature and then see what happens. They really can't. That's just, you know, at 19, 20, early 20s. But I think like getting involved in their local student government's important. Mm -hmm. I think having conversations about all that happens between those opportunities to vote in terms of following policies that affect their lives, candidates, what their voting records are 
their local communities. I mean, even that feels like a big ask, right? But if we can infuse that across the curriculum to help them become active citizens beyond, but also it would include voting, but now they see mm-hmm. to do it and they know how to do it. And like I said last week, that is not just walking into a booth and voting. That takes, a, I mean, a commitment <laughs> if you're really yeah. going to do it properly and not just say, okay, I'm going to vote for all the Democrats or all, all the Libertarians. If you're really going to think about it, it takes you, you know, it takes time. It takes research. It takes a skill set that I think a lot of our students aren't ready to take on on that level. And so I think our ongoing training is really important too. Yeah, yeah but also seeing I think, the change. Yeah. yeah. I really, and I do want to encourage everybody to look into community organizing. There's many different strategies and and, um, practices behind it, but it is teaching specific skills, right? So if you can take, and you can take it on the smallest group, like a student club, or you could take it from the ASG, or you can take it from, you know, the campus, but you focus around a a specific goal. Like what do you, what, what is your campaign? What do you want to achieve? And, and to set that marker, then that's what they're looking for, right? Then the students know when they got what they wanted to get. Because if they just say, I wanna make things better, but they haven't defined what they want to get, then it's enigmatic. They never know whether they get there and they lose the motivation to be involved. So what is it? Let's set the goal, what do you want? Now let's strategically think about the campaign and then look at lots of the community organizing techniques to get there. Um, I really like uh, uh, Jane uh, McAlevey's uh, structure tests. So you define what your goal is and then you create a series of structure tests. She's the one that did the UTLA. That technique was used for the UTLA strike and then the the most recent work action. But what a structure test is, is that you get a very simple statement and you get somebody to sign on to that statement. Like students say, um, you know, we want to guarantee that um, you know, the school is going to invest $100,000 in our basic needs center. Simple, like a simple statement, right? And then you literally get students to physically sign on to that. So you say, we have a thousand students on campus that would be using this basic needs center. The structure test would be when you have a super majority, say 75%, that's when you know you've got it. You've got it. So when you move towards that action of making guaranteeing that like you go to administration and say, we want a basic needs center, at least $100,000 funded. And the administration says, no, you know, you have a super majority power behind you. So I think a lot of the mistakes in organizing often come with not making sure that you've built your power to demand the action, right? So you have to define the action, define the campaign, and then you have to you have to have some sort of measure to know you've got it before you go after it. Um, and Patty has seen some of that in my union work on campus. Um, well, so um, so we have we were pretty successful in our our faculty union in in you know demanding what we wanted and received it. And I think part of that is knowing that we we had those structure tests. We knew who was on board and what they would do. And if you have a supermajority, you got it. So I like her techniques a lot. She has, I think a book, No Shortcut. She has a couple other books that are really good, but she's a little like leaner to learn her organizing techniques. They're like a little bit, I think, simpler to learn than some of Marshall Gans. I love Marshall Gans. I'm a big Marshall Gans fan. I will say that a part of that is that structure test is a member education. Your your it demands that you uh, organize your base basically. Yeah, one on one. Yeah, one on one. Yeah, conversation is huge. Yeah, absolutely. So there's techniques. I guess what I'm saying is like we can't just say we want to do it and then not do it. We need to teach the students the techniques. We need to rely upon community organizing techniques that we know work. But you you got to know where you're headed. And we got to teach each other those techniques as well. Yeah. And and I'm going to just throw out one of the other terms that's oftentimes used is this idea of relationship uh, building or relationship organizing um, or relational organizing, excuse me. Um, The idea that, again, you know, you've got to know the folks that you're working with. This isn't that you just go out and say, y'all come and we're going to to do this, but you, you have to form those kinds of bonds and those kinds of networks and have those relationships that are so key and so important 
um, and that they're ongoing. You know, this this adds to the sustainability of what you're doing. So it's not just bringing people together for one event and then it's over with, but creating that team, that collaboration or that network that'll continue. And so that again, I think is so important to, to all of this type of work. Um, but yeah. I just wanna say thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendy. I was I just, just gonna say with building relationships, it's also problematic if you don't build them, right? Because it's not just you need to build them, but the opposite is even worse because I'll use the example of AB 1705 again, is that faculty in the wake of knowing that that's coming, many faculty just walked into their legislative offices and yelled at the legislators and said, we don't want you to pass this. And if somebody just comes in and yells at you and then walks out, you're not gonna listen to them, right? But if you've developed a relationship with somebody and you've maintained that relationship and you go in and you say, you know, Bob, we've been friends for a long time. I've been coming in here. I've been helpful. I've brought you information from our school. I've brought you stories that help when you want to pass good legislation. And I'm telling you, there's something that's not right about this piece of legislation. I really need to talk to you about some of the unintended consequences. That's a different story. So what's happening is that with our leaders or decision makers, whether it's on campus or in a department or on legislative level or community level, if you don't have those relationships with people and you want to stop something, you can't just stop it by yelling at somebody. Yeah, how true. Um... That that is, I think, the, the the key there. You just can't go in and yell at somebody because, first of all, if somebody comes to you and they start yelling, what are you going to do? You're going to shut down. It's like, oh, go away. I don't want to talk to you. So again, that relationship component is so so very important. Well, Wendy, I know. Again, we we just want to say thank you. You've taken so much time, and this has been wonderful. Um, and Kimberly and I just want to to again extend any any sort of extra questions that anyone might have while Wendy's here. But otherwise, we just want to say thank you. Um, and before we end, because we're, we're going to actually, we decided that we'll go ahead and, and um, close the session uh, after we finish here. But we do want to make a couple of announcements before everybody logs off. But one last chance. Wendy is here. Anybody else have one last question they'd like to ask her? Yes, Violetta. Hello. So uh, I wrote a very long post in the chat, and I know that there's no time for that for Wendy to um, read through. And thank you so much, Wendy, for being here and explaining all of these things. I remember you were in our department meeting last year and shared some of these pieces, vital pieces of information with us. I'm just wondering about, the, for example, at the end of my chat post, I ask, like, how can we then make a difference? Because we are so much divided among, when I say we, I mean faculty. Some of us so much believe in CAP, California Acceleration Project, but then if they're founded by this Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know, if they're guided by their goals. And again, we, as you said, we use computers, we like uh, computers, uh, many people get jobs. Uh, through uh, all of these computer related opportunities. But then um, again, how can we unite and, and you know distinguish between what's good, what's wrong when, when so much difference exists? How do we promote the information? Our ASG, for example, so I'm not sure. I, I see that often they go and have meetings with our top admins who have pushed uh, all of these cancellations of developmental level courses. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what are our chances? There are so many things that are happening. Why are our, you know, why are admins, not just at our college, but also across other colleges, not siding with faculty, you know, sharing this is not common sense. Why are we doing that? Why are we placing students to take a course they are not ready for when they don't have the needed skills? And so I'm not sure if it makes sense, but I just saw the news uh, Chronicle of Higher Education article, and it was referring to something else, but maybe as a metaphor, or as a comparison could help. Uh, it says the deafening silence of Florida's college presidents in the midst of, midst of a crisis, they have made clear their biggest priority, job security. 
you know, and so I'm just wondering what's happening with our HG, what's happening with admins across California community colleges, you know, are these things related? Yeah, wow, some good points. So there's a saying, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's Constance Carroll says it like something like no, no college president has ever gone down a path that faculty has not uh, created or something like that. I can't remember exactly how she says it, but it's something like that. So in other words, like faculty, and this is why, you know, making sure that we have uh, protections for part-time faculty because that we have an over-reliance on part-time faculty. And then on top of that, we have 60, 65% of faculty are part-time and they don't have tenure, right? So the more part-time faculty we have, the less tenure protection faculty we have to blaze a trail. Um, but that the, the nature of, of it, and I can tell you I've been in advocacy long enough, is that faculty do have to lead the way. Because, and, and I do have, I've had so many college presidents call me and say, you were right about 1705, you were right about 928. And now what do we do? Well, okay, so that's your question. First of all, we we're, it's gonna take time. You gotta know it's gonna take time because once the legislature passes a bill, they're not gonna immediately undo the bill. They will start to work on cleanup or changes to a bill, but they have to see the, the um, consequences of that bill before they will. So we will see, I would say in about four years, we'll start to see some cleanup on that. We have to collect the student stories, which FAC does have um, a survey out that you can point students to, and it's very simple. If they have trouble accessing a class or their opinions about the class they were placed into, and it and we're collecting, we've got hundreds of students who've, who've given us information. So um, uh, make sure that you're pointing them to that and I can email it to you, Violetta, if you don't have it. Um, but I think the bigger answer is part of community organizing is coalition building, right? So we have to build coalitions with our administration, with our staff, with our students. And the I would say one of the major problems with our country right now is political polarization. And that we're seeing everything in like crazy, like red, blue, black, white, you know, conservative or liberal, you're left, I'm right. And we are all humans. We're all in this together. When the world dies from climate change, we're all dying with it. Um, and we have to look past political polarization. I have to meet with people that have different politics than I do. But I can tell you the one thing is that doesn't matter if you're Republican or rep or a Democrat, everybody values education. They do. So that we we're starting at least from a place where we all value, right? And and I, I can tell you meeting in the state leg a national legislature, everybody values education. So you start you start with you start with what you have in shared value, which is why I've used that uh, Marshall Gans technique you know, the story of us, right? So you have to connect us together. Once you've formed that relationship building, then you can move forward together. But it is about building and repairing those relationships and coalition building, and it takes time, but we can do it. We just haven't been doing it for a couple decades. We have to do it. And I, and I, again, I think part of it is Prop um, 13, which changed property taxes, has made us all so scarce for resources, we're killing each other, right, to get to those resources. We're all stepping on each other to get to the resources we need rather than supporting each other and getting, uh, you know, reapproaching how our state has resources so that we have the resources we need for our public support. Thank you. So Wendy, I just want to say again, um, thank you. And, and Kimberly and I are just so thrilled that you've been here today. Again, taking this much time. Uh, and also uh, Keelan and Rebecca from 3CSN. Again, just a, 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 you know, a thank you to you guys um, for all the work you've done. Um, I know that many of you think that this was going to be our last dialogue uh, for the semester, but we are happy to tell you we have an addition um, that's going to be a deep dive next Friday, and I want to make an announcement. And then um, don't, don't fear, because Kimberly and I will put our heads together, and we're going to start getting our list together for fall, so our series will be back. But for next Friday... Um, we are incredibly excited to um, bring together 
Nick Longo from Providence College in uh, Rhode Island, and some of you were at uh, Nick's uh, presentation earlier uh, last year, and then also Liz Clark, who is from LaGuardia Community College. Uh, both Liz and Nick have worked with College of the Canyons, uh, worked with um, other campuses uh, at the community college and four-year uh, uh, levels uh, throughout the country. Um, are just incredibly wonderful individuals and incredible scholars. And they are going to be talking about integrating a civic professional perspective into project-based learning. How can faculty and students, uh, uh, how can faculty and students uh, actually work together to uh, create a democracy that helps both self and society? So again, this is what they're going to be working on. Liz comes from a background very much steeped in project-based learning. Uh, Nick is coming from a background dealing with civic professionals and also coming out of that world of civic learning and democratic engagement. So we are just so thrilled that the two of them will be, be talking together next week. And Nick also has a publication that has just come out um, that he's going to be talking about the, the practicing democracy through this concept of civic, being a civic professional as, um, as a faculty member. So again, that will be next Friday. The only caveat is that we will be meeting from 12 until 2 instead of 10 to 12. The reason being is that um, Nick has something going on and they're both coming from the East Coast, so he will not be able to join us until um, 12 o'clock our time, specific uh, standard time. So again, we'll be sending out more information. Um, you'll register just as you normally do through um, the 3CSN uh, uh, site uh, as you've done for this, this series. So again, uh, I, we just want to say thank you for everything that you all have done and for your support today. And thank you, Wendy, for joining yes. us.